seven bucks now. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. That's, That's awesome. <laughs> You make it and it'll be a good trip for you. I like their burgers. Yeah. All their food is so good. I miss it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, wow, what a week. Uh, we've had a really good week here. We had a fun class on Wednesday night. Learned a lot of the different things in here. Um, that whole session on 
of the Truth Project on session five. They break it up into two sessions because there's so much information in there. Um, so this week we're starting on lesson six, tour number six, which is on history and whose story is it. And so when we take a look at that, uh, we've got two major things that arrive from the verses that are that are picked in in uh, Isaiah for this to be the major points in in the Truth Project study for next week. And the first one is is that God is sovereign. And uh, he's absolutely in control. And uh, in the most literal sense of in history in here, nothing happens by random or chance. And we, we found that out in, the, in our studies in session five. And even the hairs on our head are numbered is what the scriptures tell us. And the details of our lives are those threads in that great tapestry that God has woven for us in his overarching providential plan for us. And so it's, it's awesome that we have that. But secondly, we as human beings cannot understand our place in the world without cultivating some kind of vision ourselves of our part in the larger story. We're, we're testing these out for Tuesday night, and I'll get to that in just a second. Um, but we really need to know what our place is, what our purpose is. Everybody has that same question, you know, why am I here? Why was I born? You know, what is my life for? And, and so if we don't know our history, if we don't know what our purpose is, and if we don't know what God's purpose is for us, for our lives, we can never truly answer that question. And we just go through life questioning the entire time. So this session in history in here should be a really, really good session for us as well. So I, th I think it's uh, awesome that uh, Pastor Terry is going to preview that for us today. Uh, orange track racing yesterday we had the family fun time out in the square and we we're just talking about all the things that was going on out here and and uh, if you ever get the chance for chef green uh, he's a culinary instructor out at Kirkwood so he was out here cooking he's my son's next door neighbor so we've gotten a taste of these things before but his Jamaican pork and his jerk chicken and things like that are <laughs> really, really, really good. So he was out here. Uh, Carla and Bill, we want to thank them. They had made up, a, went out and bought a bunch of Hot Wheels cars and made up a little flyer, orange flyer that was taped to it. And so uh, we went out and handed out cars with a little orange track racing and a little thing about Race Street Church to the people that were out there and handed out a bunch of movie tickets to people. So, you know, they said, well, we'll try and make it. We'll try and make it. So. Hopefully, we'll have a nice crowd for the movie as well, but it was a really, really good day, and we really want to thank Carla and Bill for putting those and donating those cars and putting those packages together so we can hand those out. Uh, Tuesday, this Tuesday is Flag Day, and most people in the world today or throughout the United States don't understand what Flag Day is all about, but it's to pay tribute to our nation and pay tribute to the flag and honor our colors. So uh, on Tuesday at six o'clock at Kirkwood, uh, Pastor Terry and I are gonna be out there for the flag retirement. So when these flags come to the end of their age and they're tattered and torn and worn and, and they've lost and faded their glory, their colors, um, what we do is we collect flags throughout the year and then we have them prepped and folded by the Boy Scouts, so they make them into a proper presentation, and then we dispose of them. We actually burn the flags out there, and then we collect all the ashes, and the ashes go out to the graves of the fallen soldiers, and we sprinkle the ashes on the fallen soldiers. On top of that, we also have a tribute to our fallen soldiers, so every year we read the list of names of those soldiers from Iowa who have passed from our area here who have passed. And this year we have uh, over 170 names again to read. Um, so we invite you to come out six o'clock at Kirkwood out there. It'll be out in the parking lot uh, in front of uh, Kirkwood Hall, I believe. And um, so we, uh, we would love to have you out there and, and join us in for that. Um, it's a very moving experience. 
Um, and uh, you probably would be surprised to, to know how many of the people you know on the wings who have passed in the last year. And we do this every year. So this will be our, uh, let's see, when did we start that? 12, 12 years ago, I believe it is. So this will be our 12th year out there, if I'm not mistaken. Then, coming up July 2nd, we have an awesome movie. And that is uh, Faith of Our Fathers. And it's about the story of a couple of soldiers in the Vietnam War. And what it is, is they, they went through the war and one was a believer and one wasn't a believer in, in their interactions through that time. But what they're doing is their sons now are getting together and they are going back and finding out about this history. And it's a very, very touching moving story, Faith of Our Father. So we look forward to that July 2nd, right here. Doors open at 5.30, movie at 6 o'clock. And as always, brownie bites, <laughs> hot dogs, popcorn, yes. everything's provided. So let's open our time here with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for this opportunity to be gathered here together freely and openly, that you would pour your praise upon us today, that you would pour your glory into our hearts, that you would move our souls to be in touch with you and to be in sync with you, Lord. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come into our presence today, and we ask for your Holy Spirit to just permeate our souls, that we can understand and learn what your purpose is for our lives, why we are here, and, and what we can do to help serve others in your name. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this opportunity. We ask that uh, you would bless Pastor Terry as he uh, prepares to give that message here this morning. And we just uh, pray a blessing over those who can't be with us here this morning. And for those who are online, we, we praise you and thank you that they are able to join us that way as well. So Father God, we just praise you and thank you in all these things. In your precious and holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. I did forget one thing, which is Orange Track Racing is July 8th. So. Had to make sure I get everything in there. So our call to worship today uh, that Pastor Terry has chosen comes from Isaiah 46, uh, 9 and 10. And this one comes from the, uh, what is this version? New Century Version. New Century Version. Okay, I was going to say, I don't recognize those three letters. So it says, remember what happened long ago. Remember that I am God and there is no other God. I am God, and there is no one like me. From the beginning, I told you what would happen in the end, and a long time ago, I told you things that have not yet happened. When I plan something, it happens. What I want to do, I will do. So how many in here love history, okay? How many people in here found it really boring and it was kind of just, well, why am I wasting my time on history? Well, that was me a long time ago. I thought history was a really boring subject. Why do I want to learn about all this old and moldy stuff from years gone by? However, I started building exhibits for the History Center downtown. And so as I was building these exhibits, I had to do all of this research and then prepare all the scripts and we have interactive exhibits and all these things down there. And I got really fascinated in what I didn't know about the town that I lived in because a lot of the exhibits were on this very area and there is so much I didn't realize that happened in this area. And there's so much that happens in this town and things that are named in this town which we don't understand what the name applies to. But it was really amazing to me to go back through it and find out these things in history. And then a lot of things made a lot more sense. So I really got into history then and uh, understanding why history is so important for us. And uh, especially genealogy is important. We need to understand who we are, where we came from, and who came before us in our family line so that we can understand what our position is as we 
we go through our life. And one of the biggest things in, in history is that I got really fascinated with how history repeats itself over and over and over again. And that's a very, very valuable lesson for each and every one of us to learn because if we don't learn from the past mistakes, we are doomed to make those mistakes again. And we see that repeated throughout history. I mean, you can trace some of the things that are going on today, the mistakes that are being made yet today, all the way back to biblical times. Why? Because people didn't learn from the mistakes. They didn't learn the history. They didn't take the time to understand how very, very important it is. So people can ruin their entire lives because they didn't learn from the mistakes throughout their lives. So what we need to do is we need to understand uh, and believe that our past can help forge our future. And that's very, very important. I'm sure Terry's gonna expound on that here in a little while. So as we prepare to go into our time of worship in here and, and hear the message that Pastor Terry's presented to us today, let's, let's go to the Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are all-knowing and wise. Teach us your ways. We seek your wisdom and your insight. We want to have knowledge and understanding. So we seek your wisdom. So that we can walk on the path that you lay before us. Knowing right from wrong. Protecting us against temptation and deceit. Keeping us focused on the destiny that you planned for. Lord, help our faith grow daily and keep us from the distractions of the world that would separate us from you. Bless Pastor Terry as he gives the message this morning that you put on his heart and help him to teach us your ways as always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> You know, I, I would have thought that as I was preparing the message, genealogy would have popped up for me because every year at our Van White family reunion, one of uh, the, the gentlemen that helps to put that on, his name is Rod, and he prints out, and I think he, I don't know if he reprints it every year, because it literally from floor to about here, and it's, it's all done on 8.5 by 11, so he's taping all this together. And it, it's going to run from probably right here, crossed, and then over as far on that side. And it goes all the way back to the 1600s. Uh, so it's, it's an extensive uh, reminder of where we did come from. So uh, that's your fault for putting that thought in my head. <laughs> <laughs> we just extended the sermon by two minutes. Well, in this, in this section in history, whose story, there's billions and billions of stories out there. And through this uh, sixth installment of the Truth Project, the word remember is central to that message. Now, remember means to bring to mind or think of again and to retain in the memory. You know, as we've done throughout this series, we're just going to fall back to a book, actually the dictionary that was written not quite 200 years ago. It's hard to believe we're six years shy of this book celebrating a 200th anniversary, but the Webster's 1828 dictionary says this as a uh, definition for the word remember. Remember the days of old, referencing this passage from Deuteronomy 32.7. Remember the days of long ago. Think about the generations past. Ask your father, and he will inform you. Inquire of your elders, and they will tell you. So what do you remember of years past? Yesterday we had Hot Wheels, and every time I'm transported back to my bedroom, as a child, and this is when we lived in Prairie City, and we lived there until 1970. So I was three and a half-ish years old when we moved. So this would have been 68, 69. I was either two or three, and I remember this. There was a chair that we would put by the closet door, and there was a window right here, and 
would run this way and there was a bookshelf here and another window here and it wasn't a very long it was not 42 feet like what we're running and it wasn't four lanes it was one but it had that uh, deep purple connector <laughs> hooked to the back of that chair and I would run those cars over and over and over again and then another memory fast forward just a few short years to 1974 and some of you will remember that there was a blizzard and well in 1974 I'm eight so you know I'm not real tall at that point but the snow drift was humongous perspective dad shoveled out a hole in that that big old drift between the shed and the back of the house and my brother and I hung out in there all winter long I also remember a significant event in history and part of the reason I probably remember it is because it happened on my 14th birthday when Mount St. Helens blew. To this day I have a small, you remember those jars from the 70s of jelly? Yeah, yeah I've got one of those. It's about this full of ash. It was picked up out of the back, somebody's backyard in Yakima, Washington. And then the other memories that come to mind. And this memory is, it hit this week after we laid Diane's dad to rest. It was when I fed my mom her last bite of a meal. History is important. Remembering where we came from is important. This morning we're going to get a glimpse of our place in God's story. Now, this is God's story. What we have to and this is what he has given us. There's much more to this story. We'll be privy to that when we enter into our glory. But God's understanding our place in God's story and how and why it's important for us to understand and remember history and to put it into the proper context. It's very important. Isn't it incredible the things that we remember. These were just a short, I was just typing away and it's like um, highlight and delete because that's going to add 20 minutes on because of all these memories that were coming flooding into me. But it's so incredible that we remember so many things from our past and even from such a young age. But why is that history important? There's people out there that say it's not important because, you know what, the past is the past. It's over, it's done with, forget about it. Well, they're wrong. They're very wrong. It is extremely important. It teaches us, it tells us how we got to where we are right now, right here. Gray Street Church, and specifically its uh, corporate name, Prayer Care Share Ministries, have a history. It's not a long history. It seems like just yesterday we were meeting in our in our uh, living rooms, discussing, just kicking off a ministry. Didn't even have a name at that point. But that was in November of 2016. That's coming up on six years here, real quick. We held our first service in January of 2018, just four short years ago. Uh, yeah, four short years ago. I was going to say two. It's still, it moves along. But here's the thing. History, it teaches it. It, it tells us how we got where we are. It, it builds an empathy within us that as we study the lives of those who came before us and their struggles, it helps us to understand what they went through. It helps us to understand what they did and what they said and why they did those things. And while the way people lived in the past may be different than the way we live now, because well, we have air conditioning again. We have cars that we can go from one place to the other. The basic goals and values of our lives are the same. People want security. People want to be loved. People want happiness. Some want power and wealth. 
but my wealth is in my family, so that's one of the things that I want. Listen to what the writer of Ecclesiastes says about history. This comes from 1, 9, and 11. It says, history merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. I'm going to stop right there. Nothing in a sense truly new. We hear a lot about bullying in our schools right now. That's nothing new. What is new is how that bullying is taking place and how technology has simply amplified it, making it worse than what it was. Nothing new. The writer continues in verse 10 saying, Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past. And in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. And remember that because that's going to be important when we come to another point here in just a little bit here. See, we know from their choices that the Israelites were constantly wavering between God and false gods or the pagan gods. But then we get to that scripture that Mark read from this morning for the call to worship. And I'm going to add just one more verse to that. We're going to add verse 11. Listen to this one more time. He says, remember what happened long ago. Remember that I am God and there is no other God. I am God and there is no one like me. From the beginning, I told you what would happen in the end. A long time ago, I told you things that <coughs> have not happened yet. <coughs> When I plan something, it happens. What I want to do, I will do. I am calling a man from the east to carry out my plan. He will come like a hawk from a country far away. He will make it what I have said come true. I will do what I have planned. See, God is very clearly instructing us here that we need to remember what happened in the past. We need to remember that there are no other gods but God. That happens all too often today. Everything else, people made think other things, God, whether it's wealth, whether it's possessions. But he is telling us here in this passage as well that he is in control. <coughs> and that he knows the future even before it happens. These verses remind us that we are to remember our commitment to God. Here's the important part here. Because he has not forgotten his to us. Never has he forgotten it, never has he wavered from it. God is saying he is the one who is fulfilling his purpose and his plan. And it's a plan that if we listen to what Paul writes in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, we can see that plan fulfilled. Paul writes, but when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. God's plan from the beginning was to redeem us. He knew the exact time, the right time, to send Jesus. And we have to trust in his timing and not our own. We saw how well that worked out for Abraham and Sarah after they were promised that the descendants would be as greater than the, the sand on the shore, right? But what happened? It didn't happen fast enough for them. So they took matters into their own hands. And if you don't know what happened, go look it up. I got a book you can read. We got lots of them. We'll let you borrow one. We'll even give one to you. Take it home and read it. Throughout Scripture, God is telling us this plan, but are we listening? Do we hear what He is saying to us? And the difficult part for us is we may hear the words, but oh, here's here's the hard part. You have to give up control of your life. God lead. Over time, things do change. We change. I'm not the person that Diane married 
20, almost 22 years ago. One thing that popped into my mind, I was listening to something this week and I heard they were talking about words and how words have changed over time. And, you know, it goes back to what we did we, earlier. We dropped back to the Webster's Dictionary from 1828 to just compare definitions. Well, here's some interesting uh, changes in the way that words used to mean and what they mean to us now. Today, you might hear a kid say, nice. It's a compliment. It used to mean something that was silly or foolish or just simple. Very different definition than what it means today. And then there's the word awful. Today, awful things are very bad or very unpleasant, right? But years and years ago, awful meant worthy of law. Isn't that interesting? There's so many other words I, I had, again, highlighted them, deleted them right out of the Word document that I was writing in. But then I thought, let's add this to this. Today we have words that never existed before. It used to say, go search for something. Go search for it. What do we say now? Google it. Just Google it. I almost said that a little bit ago when I was about Abraham and Sarah. Just Google it. Notice we don't say Yahoo it. Or ask Jeeves. We say Google it. And today you're not just angry because you're hungry. You're hangry. And rather than have a civilized discussion, one-on-one, -on -one, or in a group, where you can share opposing viewpoints, if someone doesn't like what you have to say, they want to cancel you. Which leads to a net, and this is actually in the dictionary now, it's called cancel culture. And as I was doing some research on these things, it blew my mind that hundreds of words are added to the dictionary every year. Hundreds. And we don't notice them like we used to because we don't go out and buy a dictionary anymore. Can you imagine how thick? It's got to be multiple binds because it's going to get awfully heavy. But that also brought in another thought to my mind. What we believe now in the present has been determined by our past. Ask people born before the 80s what Jenny's number is. Sorry, all you Because y'all are going to be singing that song in your head now. They're going to tell you 8675309. They're just going to rattle it right off without even a thought. <laughs> Ask somebody born after that time, and they're going to look at you and go, who's Jenny? The point of that is, is we can go back a few thousand years to just after Joseph died. Remember what all he did for Egypt, not just for his own people, but for Egypt. And while he was alive, they lived peacefully in Egypt. But listen to what Stephen said as he is confronting the council. This comes from Acts 7, 7 and 19. As the time drew near when God would fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt greatly increased. But then a new king came to the throne of Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph. This king exploited our people and oppressed them, forcing parents to abandon their newborn babies so they would die. The new king had no idea. He obviously didn't look at any history of his people or of his country. So he did what he wanted and he treated the Israelites in the way that he wanted to. And he made them their slaves. Now this is context. This is learning the context behind 
history about our scriptures. And this is why Mark and I are so very adamant about studying the Bible and understanding that context. And that is why the next part of the message today is so critical. Because we're going to talk about the danger and power of this historical revisionism. Another one of those $10 words. So what is historical revisionism? It's defined as this, a process where history is altered or the past is reinterpreted in order to accomplish a particular agenda or objective. If you rewrite the past, you can make people believe whatever you want in the present. There is a large liberal agenda to rewrite history in order to leave Christian themes and God out of <coughs> public academia. And yes, I said that. That is not to put down anyone who has liberal thoughts, that that's the way that they lean. I'm not putting them down. It's just that that is, this is fact. This is what's happening. And we're seeing that today. And I was going to say something like, we don't see anything like that today. But I didn't think I could do it with a straight face. So we just left that out. There are people who think nothing of telling a story just to make a buck or to get their 15 minutes of fame. There, the, there's a, an example that we're going to hear a little bit more about on Wednesday night, but in her autobiography, Rigoberta Menchu, she wrote of being a poor Guatemalan woman whose family was oppressed by light-skinned landowners and brutalized by right wing soldiers. She used this as a way of promoting Marxism in her country. It won her the Nobel Peace Prize in 1992. It became required reading in universities and colleges to raise awareness, not only of the plight of women, but indigenous people in general, at the hands of, and this is how they put it, US-backed capitalists. She got found out. It's kind of like David got found out. Nathan came in and it's like, yeah, you, uh, you had Uriah killed to cover up your your affair with Bathsheba. Well, in 1999, just seven years after that, David Stoll, who was a graduate student at Stanford, he was studying, doing his work on anthropology and he discovered her story. And he started asking about it because he, it was like, wow. And so he talked to the people in the village where all these things supposedly happened and nothing happened. None of the things. In fact, She came from a land-owning family, a family that had wealth. Now, she made a mistake. She did something wrong. If that were a company, they would have to take steps to rectify that problem, right? They would have to re maybe recall a toy because it's got a choking hazard. They have to take responsibility for their error. Or we see a lot of food getting recalled for bacteria or things of that nature these days. So what happened to her? Not a thing. To Mr. Stoll, who found her out, they tried to shame, discredit, and disgrace him. Here's the scary part. This comes from... Uh, a Wellesley Spanish professor by the name of Marjorie Agosin. Whether her book is true or not, I don't care. What is important is getting students to believe what we want in the present. You see, others simply rewrite history to fit the narrative they want. Let's look at another example that's used in the upcoming lesson this week. It's the Mayflower Compact. The new school version of this, notice the, the it's not redacted. Well, it kind of is. It's been edited. So this is the way it's being presented now. It says, we whose names are underwritten having undertaken a voyage to plant the first colony. Now let's look at it the way that it originally wrote. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith, 
a voyage to plant the first colony. By revising the Mayflower Compact, writers of textbooks have left God out. This goes back to another quote here. It says, if, we re if you rewrite the past, you can make people believe whatever you want in the present. Guess what? It's not anything new today. Let's drop back to the beginning. Now we're going to skip to Genesis 3 because God's already created everything. This is where things kind of go south on us. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? He is trying to rewrite history because, and, and you're going to have to come Wednesday night to see how uh, Dr. Tackett does this when he talks about the past and the, and the present because, well, I'll leave it at that. Both Adam and Eve would succumb to the serpent's lie. They would succumb to his revision of what God had said to them. And this happens over and over again from that point on. In the New Testament, the guards who were keeping watch over Jesus' tomb were bribed to keep from telling the truth. Matthew 28, 11 and 15. Now, the women have already seen Jesus. They're on their way home. Some of them, so the guards went into the city. To the, when you read this passage, they go to the leading priests. They didn't go to the Roman officials, they went to the priests. It's important to remember that. And those leading figures, those, those priests and, and the religious leaders, what did they do? They said, that didn't happen. We, we can't live here. And, you know, it's like, here, let me, uh, let's get that taken care of. How much is that going to cost us? It doesn't say. But it was a large bribe. And then in verse 14, this is what they tell them. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble because the fact that Jesus was no longer there should have led to their deaths. Now, in the last few minutes, we've covered a fictional autobiography. We've covered the removal or omission of words to fit a specific agenda and outright lying about events just to cover them up. And these all still happen today. But there's one more type of omission that I want to cover. And, and Mark has talked about this in the past, and, and it just sat on top of my mind. And this isn't in the lesson. This is something that's completely out, but it fits so well here. And it's the omission of not just a full chapter, but another half a chapter, because the half chapter leads into, it's, a, it's an introduction into the full chapter. And in his book, Refuting Rabbinic Objections to Christianity and Messianic Pro Prophecies, Aiton Barr writes this. He says, the 17th century Jewish historian, Jewish historian, Raphael Levi admitted that long ago the rabbis used to read Isaiah 53 in synagogues. But after the chapter caused arguments and great confusion, the rabbis decided that the simplest thing would be to just take that prophecy out of the, out of the Haftara readings in synagogues. That's why today when we read Isaiah 52, we stop in the middle of the chapter and the week after we jump straight to Isaiah 54. 17th century, that means the 1600s. 600 years ago already, all that time, this has been left out of the Jewish teachings. Can you imagine the controversy that happens when that chapter, when the last half of 52 and all of 53 is read by someone of the Jewish faith? Why? Because it contains the prophecy of how the Messiah will atone for our sins.
So at the most basic level, this historical revisionism that we're talking about is just about telling a lie. Because lies are outright, little white lies, lies of omission, it's still a lie. So let's talk about fact and fiction just for a quick second. Just a little fun exercise for you here. So this is the, we're gonna talk a little bit about the differences between fact and fiction. So here's a statement. Professional baseball umpires are required to wear black underwear. Fact or fiction? It's fact. How about this? It takes 11 feet of wire to make a slinky. Fact or fiction? Fiction. It's 63. <laughs> the looks on some of your faces. Velcro was invented in Great Britain. Fact or fiction? You know, we don't think it was the United States, but it's, it is fiction. It was in Switzerland. And finally, and this goes, Mark must have been in my head or something because he brought breakfast, they brought breakfast pizza for uh, before service. And I think we're going, we're taking my dad to Pizza Ranch after service. So. Um, the average American eats 46 slices of pizza per year. Fact or fiction? And more. Remember, it's, 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 it's average because there's some, Strange people out there that don't eat pizza. <laughs> that, that, well, my dad, we were, we were talking here not too long ago, and I remember when I was a kid going to the Pizza Hut in Webster City on Tuesday nights for family night because it was an all you can eat. And remember this word, smorgasbord. I sat and ate 22 pieces one night. Oh my. I had a high metabolism, it's still pretty high. So I pro I'll probably eat more chicken than I eat pizza <coughs> today, but I love my pizza. But it's fact, 42 slices is the average number of slices eaten per year. So here's what the question, why is it so hard for us to believe the Bible is true? We have, I'm gonna use this word, a plethora <laughs> of examples. There are 24,000 ancient copies of the New Testament, and still it gets questioned. Yet there are only five copies of Aristotle's writings, and no one questions them. Let's take that a step further. Those copies of Aristotle's writing only date back to about um, 1100 A.D., that's only 1,400 years after he wrote the originals. That's a lot of time. Let's look at a copy of Matthew. There is a copy of Matthew that they believe was written either while he was still alive or just right after he died. I mean, we're talking about manuscripts that are in existence that date back to less than 25 years, not 1,400. Even some of the longer ones don't go more than, say, about 500 years, 550 years. It simply blows my mind that the accuracy of the Bible is constantly questioned the way it is when we have such proof out there. But George Orwell says this, he who controls the past controls the future. When you can rewrite the past, you can control what people believe in the future. Look at history. And I love history. I've always loved history. I, I've got hundreds of books on history. And I fortunately was blessed. My mom worked for a, a Meredith warehouse when I was a kid. And they would have book sales. And I, I don't know why I gravitated around World War II, but I did. I have this encyclopedia of World War II that books is like this big and it's about this thick. It, I love that. But if you can rewrite it, you can change what people believe in the future. 
Remember what we heard in, in previously is that um, they had threatened to get rid of all copies of the Bible until there was only one left. And that would be for antiquity's sake. Good luck with that, guys. This is why in Isaiah 46, we are given God's mandate to remember. Who of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life? I've seen it black and white. I've seen it in color. I prefer black and white. It just looks good. But who remember Uncle Billy and the little strings of the little strings he would tie around his fingers to remember things? He did that to try and remember the things he needed to get done. Well, as we saw in the movie, um, that didn't help him much because he couldn't remember what the strings were for. This is very different than the mandate that we're getting from God, and very different from what he asked the Israelites to do. He used memorial stones and tassels to re for us to, them to remember. One of the first references to memorial stones in the Bible is in Genesis 28. Jacob has that dream. Remember the dream where he's seeing the angels going up and down the stairway between earth and heaven. And in that dream, the Lord tells him that he is giving them the ground he's lying on. And the Lord promises not to leave him until he has finished giving him everything he had promised. Now, he doesn't receive that in his lifetime. That comes to his descendants. But the next morning, Jacob wakes up in awe. And he used the stone that he had rested his head. We're all worried about a soft pillow. He used the stone to rest his head on that night. And he made that stone a memorial pillar. And he anointed it in oil, and he called the place Bethel, which means house of God. In Joshua 4, God commands the Israelites, as they're crossing the Jordan into the Promised Land, he says so he has one representative from each traffic go into the middle of the Jordan and gather a stone. And they go over to uh, the Promised Land side, and they set up a memorial. And it's to be used to tell their children what the Lord did and stop not just in stopping the water from flowing. Remember, this is he also did that with the Red Sea. He stopped water from he created dry land as they left Egypt and as they went into the promised land. But allowed them into the promised land. That memorial was to show God's goodness and his love and his miraculous assistance to them. And in 1 Samuel 7, after God had led the Israelites to victory, Samuel took a large stone and made it a memorial, and he called it Ebenezer. Now, y'all hear that name and you think Christmas story, or Christmas carol, excuse me. But it's not. Ebenezer means the stone of help. It was to remind them of the help that God had given them, and they should never forget his grace. God used one other thing to help the Israelites remember it, and that is the tassels that they were to put on the hems of their clothes. In Numbers 15, 38 and 39, he said, giving the following instructions to the people of Israel throughout the generations to come, you must take, make tassels for the hems of your clothing and attach them with a blue cord. When you see the tassels, now hear what they're remembering for this, you will remember and obey all the commands of the Lord instead of following your own desires and defiling yourselves as you are prone to do. The stones were remembrances of events of the things God had done. The tassels were to remind them of his commandments. It was to help them to keep from their own selfish, self-centered desires. Both of them were. And in other words, it, they were to do things God's way and not our own, because how often do we want to do it our own way? We, we tried finding our new location our own way, and it didn't work out until we let God. If we're trying to do things under our own power, then we will find ourselves in a battle with the very nature of God. And the battle that we wage is not like the battle that we read about. It's not like the battle that's going on over in the Ukraine, the war that's going on in the Ukraine. It's a spiritual battle. 
Here's what Paul writes to Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And we are not here to live according to the world's standards, but to live by God's. God is our commander-in-chief, and we must submit to his authority. And in doing this, we can stay away from the things of this world that lead us to ultimate destruction. Psalm 33, 10, 11 says, The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes, but the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. They may not happen in the time frame that we want them to, but they always happen. Scriptures are a testament to that. Without God, we have no hope. Those who do not believe have no hope. They say things like, you're born, you live, you die. Whatever you do in between, that's up to you as long as it makes you feel good. It's all about you. Do whatever you want. And when it's all said and done and it's all over, you're just warm food anyway. That may be true for our physical bodies. But there is more for us. And there's more for them. They don't realize this. We're going to a place, a really good place. I've said this before, I'll scrub the toilets with a toothbrush. I'm okay with it. <laughs> it's much better than ending up in an eternal lake of fire. The world would have you believe there is not another story out there. It's not, there's not a bigger or larger story out there. But our, the stories of our lives are woven together. Mark and I meet pretty regularly on Monday nights when he's in town. And I'm glad he's going to be in town because this week because we get to meet again. Our lives are like this. Mark and I both grew up in the Methodist church. Mark and I both had first wives who had addictions. We have Brady Bunch type families there. We have children. We both came into ministry in a little bit different ways. We both have done different things for work, but we're both tech geeks. Our lives are woven together. God intertwined our lives in a specific way. And we see that weaving in here when it comes to Jesus from the very beginning to the very end. Jesus is in and through every last word in here. The Old Testament has God's promises throughout. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did not see the fulfillment of the promise that God made to them. David does not see the promise that God made to him that his house, his kingdom, and throne would be established forever. So David wasn't any different than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But what did they do? They remained faithful. They became the stepping stones that lead us where? To Jesus. See, a people who are caught up in their own little story will never be willing to lay themselves down as stepping stones for others. So here's the challenge. Are you going to be the stepping stones? And I started out with your descendants, but I, I, I quickly changed that. Are you going to be the stepping stones for those who come after you? Preparing them for Jesus' return, knowing that Jesus may not return in your lifetime. Are you prepared to do that? It gets more difficult every single day in this world. Are you prepared to do that? Look back at our history. See what the faithful did. Go into Hebrews and grab chapter 11. 
and read it. Because what is that chapter called? It's called the faith chapter. I'm not going to read it right now. I'm going to challenge you to take that home and read it. These are great examples of faith. And this is what it starts out with. You have to read the rest by yourself. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. And the reminder in here, God is reminding us one more time, through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. And it was through that faith that we got to where we are now. We are standing, I'm standing right here. You're sitting right there. You're watching online because people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David, and so many others became the stepping stones. Whose story? It's God's story. We are part of that because we were adopted into his family. Father, thank you for adopting us into your family. And Father, it, uh, helping us to understand the context of what that means because in adoption in the Roman culture, you became just like an actual flesh and blood son or daughter when you were adopted. So you have adopted us into your family. You have given us these examples throughout your love letter to us, the Bible, to show us how we can be stepping stones to those in the future. Yes, Father, we need to know our history, and we need to know it in the context that it was originally written, because to rewrite it, we lose all the important things, good or bad. Because when it comes to the bad, Father, we need to be reminded that's what not to do. And the good is what should be done. Father, help us as believers, as your children, as we leave this place and go out into the world to use the words from your message today to show others and to be their stepping stone. In Jesus' name. Pastor Terry, as we come into this time of communion today, um, we are following what the scriptures tell us to do, and it is a time of remembrance. Communion is a time for us to gather together in commune with one another as believers in the faith, and it's a time for us to remember that sacrifice that Christ made for us. See, we're fulfilling God's command when we take communion together. It's to remember the things that God has done for us in our life. It's to also remember what is written that God is going to do for us in our lives in the future. So it's a stepping stone, a way for us to come back to what God has planned for us, and what God has done for us, and what he will do. So as we come into this time of communion today, it is a time to remember. And so when we have that, it says, do this in remembrance of me. It's a time for us to remember all of those things. God's promises, God's promises that have been fulfilled and fulfilled in his son Jesus in giving us that way to eternal life. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, later in the meal, he took a cup and after he filled it, he blessed it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And it further goes on to tell us then that each time that we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do it in remembrance of me. Because history is important. We need to remember all of these things that God has for us. Remember it properly so that history cannot be rewritten and revised. As we take this today, let us remember all of God has done for us. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Thanks be to God. Now we'll have our time of prayer for the people.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I just pray God will give me a voice this morning. <laughs> so, is there any prayers for others that you would ask for? I've got a few I'm going to pray for. Or... Okay. Well, Father God, today we want to acknowledge you for all things, for life and breath, for random miracles, for protection for your people. For the beauty of the world you have given us to live in, we thank you for who you are, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, the Great I Am. You are our Redeemer and Protector in this life. You are our Tower of Refuge in times of need. We praise you and thank you for all you have done for us. We thank you, Lord God, for safe travels for so many, for Mark as he goes to and from work, um, all over the country. I pray for Denny's visit to his sister in um, St. Louis next weekend. I pray for safe travels for him, Lord God. I thank you, God, for uh, safe travels for Antonin and Sarah and Victoria as they traveled to Texas last week to uh, learn more about the mission for Africa. We pray you will bless them with many opportunities to serve you in this ministry. I thank you for this weekend with my children from Wyoming and Texas who stopped by on their way from Indiana to Colts Eye Visit and uh, he got a, a good visit there this week and um, we pray for their safe travels as they drive back to Wyoming today and tomorrow and Dylan flies back to Texas today. Uh, we trust you for their protection and thank you for the time you've spent with family. Oh, Father God, we thank you for the great blessings for Grace Street Church. We praise you for the event held yesterday. I pray you open minds and put a fire in people's hearts to want to come and join our church, to learn more about you, to serve you as we should. I pray that people will open their Bibles and read your word so that they can be filled with the Holy Spirit and find that personal relationship with you and the blessings in life that come with that for walking with you daily and the blessings of life that we could never imagine for ourselves. I pray miracles over our lives in Jesus' name. Father God, I pray for homeless people that you will protect them each and every day I pray for food and shelter put Christian people in their path Lord God and help them to find you Lord Jesus provide their jobs for them for those who are willing and able to serve you Lord God let them let it be so and as you say in Isaiah 41 10 so do not fear for I am with you do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God, you are so good to your people that you count us as your children, that whoever believes in you will not perish but have everlasting life. We trust and we believe this, Jesus, for you are God. And you are the only God. In Jesus' holy name, we praise you. Amen. Thank you. History teaches us so very many things. From the simple things of how do we change this space from a sanctuary to a racetrack for Hot Wheels to a movie theater and back to a sanctuary or to a place to have a feast where we share a meal together. History tells us the best ways to do that. When we first set up, the chairs were all nice and neat in a row. 
We found out that didn't work while well. history taught us. Offset the chairs. So even if you're sitting in behind someone who's tall, you can still see. God provides us with so many examples of how we are to live our lives through the scriptures. If you are not already doing so, get into Bible study. Join us on a Wednesday night. If you can't do that, open your Bible on a daily basis, I implore you. Make that the very first thing you do. I get up early just to do that. And it makes a difference. History has shown me that my days are better when I start with God than when I don't. Father, as we prepare to end this portion of our service this morning, we thank you for the examples of the saints, for their willingness to be the stepping stones that lead to us. But Father, let us not be the end of that path let us each individually pick up and put down another stone and another and another, preparing the way for others. Father, also help us to look into and understand what you truly are saying because of the context in which it has been, has been, has been written. We don't want to leave anything out. We need to know the way that it happened. And your scriptures tell us that. Let it not be rewritten. Let the things be not omitted from it. We need to understand it. And Father, I would end this with what you've said in the Psalms. Be still. In Jesus' name.